Hello, everyone, and welcome back to an all new episode of the Financial Confessions. It's me, your host, Chelsea Fagan, founder and CEO of The Financial Diet and woman who loves talking about money. And today I am joined by someone who also loves talking about money, something that I am pleased to say is becoming more and more common in the years since starting TFD. Next year will actually be the 10 year anniversary of me starting my own personal blog, The Financial Diet, which became this company. And in many ways, looking back, I am deeply heartened to see the way the conversation around money has changed, especially with people younger than myself. When I first started TFD, there was a real absence of anything in the personal finance industry that wasn't, quite frankly, geared toward wealthy, older white men. And most of the rhetoric around money, whether it was on the surface or more subliminal and suggested, had a bit of a ultra libertarian bootstrap bent to it that effectively boiled down to your financial status being a result of your character or your intelligence or your inherent worth. If you were poor, it was your fault. And if you were rich, it sort of automatically meant that you were a good person. Now, of course, we know if we watch TFD that neither of those things are true, and that in America in particular, your financial destiny is largely determined by where you started financially. Although, as we discuss often, there are ways to improve the hand that you're working with. I'm happy to say that now there is a much broader landscape of who is talking about money and how they are talking about it. And particularly as it pertains to younger people, there has been a real awakening around the the systemic inequalities and quite frankly, inherent unfairness of our financial system. Wealth inequality is at gilded age levels or beyond, and most people are starting to realize that when it comes to things like massive student debt, the limited job market, stagnant wages, and a basically rigged financial system, we are not playing on fair terms. And in many cases, we're sold a dream that is simply economically not viable. We're no longer able to expect that if we get the right degree, that we will automatically be able to get a good paying job, that's enough to support a family on a single income, or even a single person on a single income. All of that said, though, while there is an awakening toward the unfairness of our financial system, there is also a reclaiming of what it means to be intentional with money. Yes, we are playing with a very unfair hand, but we can also be a lot more thoughtful and intelligent about dealing with the choices that we have financially. We don't need to spend recklessly, we don't need to constantly prioritize our current selves over our future selves, and we don't need to inherently associate our money with our worth. My guest today is someone who only started her media company just about two years ago, but has exploded in popularity, creating a narrative around money that is fresh and interesting and quite frankly, bingeable. I watched like 50 of her videos before filming this this morning. She is someone who I am quite frankly, enormously impressed by on an entrepreneurial level, but also really interested to speak to as far as how she perceives money and where she stands on all of the things we just discussed and more. Without further ado, I am so, so thrilled to welcome my guest today, who is a creator, an entrepreneur, founder and CEO of Your Rich BFF, Vivian Tu. Thanks so much for having me, Chelsea. Thank you for being here. And this episode is sponsored by Quince. Shop high quality luxury items without luxury prices. Go to quince.com slash TFC to get free shipping and 365 day returns on your next order. Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash TFC. Please tell us, uh, for those who may not know, although I'm sure most of my audience does, uh, what is Your Rich BFF? Your Rich BFF is, I wish I had a better answer, a happy accident. Um, I started my career as an equities trader on Wall Street, aka I was trading stocks. And when I left the industry, I went into the tech and media space and I was making a lot of new friends, a lot of new colleagues, and they all wanted me to help them rebalance their 401ks, help them pick the right health insurance, help them decide which investments made the most sense for them. And I got so many of the same questions. I was like, oh, you guys are so annoying. I'm going to put this on the internet. And you guys can just refer to video seven for this, refer to video 28 for that. And I didn't realize that so many people needed this information in that way. And my very first video ended up going viral. This is right in the heat of the pandemic when people are getting stimulus checks and you're seeing 15 year old boys telling people from their parents' basement that they should YOLO those stimulus checks into Bitcoin or Tesla calls. And it was just a really scary time financially for a lot of people. And I think that 
your rich BFF was built from a place of lack of education. And, you know, to your guys' point, like TFD does such a great job of educating people in a simple and digestible way. And that was also the aim of your rich BFF. It was to make talking about finance, talking about money, talking about saving, budgeting, investing, bingeable, snackable. You could do it in 60 seconds every single day and be smarter while also not feeling so overwhelmed and feeling like you were speaking and listening to a financial system that had frankly never served you up until this point. Well, that last thing you said is something I'm really interested in because you are, I believe you're 28. Is that right? 29. Oh, 20. don't remind me. <laughs> oh, girl, enjoy it. Um, but so you are a bit younger than I am. Um, but I do think even within those micro generations, um, even within different sort of uh, tr tranches of millennial and Gen Z and what have you, there is a really shifting perception around economics uh, and around what we should be aspiring to. So, you know, for me, I definitely, and when TFD was first starting, um, but when I was, you know, early in my career, that was really the peak of the girl boss era, which I think really approached money from, um, you know, obviously a very hyper capitalist way, but also an extremely individualist and extremely sort of um, work centric way in the sense of your identity should be primarily based around work, that earning money is in and of itself a good thing, um, that more women in power is automatically better, no matter what it means for women who work beneath them or women as a whole. Um, all of these kind of notions that I think we, even the micro generation that came after mine has already kind of rejected and been like, no, that's bullshit. Um, and we recently did a video on the phenomenon um, on, you know, TikTok and other social media platforms of this idea of like the stay at home girlfriend, slow life, you know, really kind of reverting back to, an, uh, for women especially, uh, a view of work and earning that is... Um, really sort of almost antagonistic. Like, I don't want to do those things. I don't want to define myself that way, which, as we discussed in the video, is, you know, probably in some ways better for mental health than, you know, working yourself into dust the way the girl boss era told you to do, but also puts women in an extremely vulnerable position that prior generations fought really hard to get themselves out of. So from your perspective, kind of being, uh, you know, in a, in a slightly younger generation, how do you see women relating to money right now? And what are the ways in which you see it being healthier than what's come before and maybe less so? Yeah, so I totally agree with you that like each micro generation has like a theme. And I feel like our parents' generation was like the, we, we were able to get it done, so why can't you? And then there was definitely this like girl boss, hustle culture, rah, rah, which was essentially just the same thing, except with like pink font. And then after, I would say that like right now, um, the state of finances and the state of the global economy for so many feel insurmountable, feel so dire that it's almost this well, I'm never going to retire anyway mentality. So I might as well enjoy today. And I think that's led to what you kind of alluded to, which many have dubbed the sprinkle sprinkle movement. And this is essentially where it's now seen as almost comical, but also kind of positive when women are able to not work, be stay at home girlfriends, just have money handed to them from, you know, male counterparts or their partners, what have you. But I find that to be two bad opposite ends of the spectrum, right? So to the point of like, we don't want to work ourselves to dust, but this sprinkle sprinkle movement of like, I want to be a stay at home girlfriend. I want a sugar daddy. I want someone to like pay for my life. I want someone to give me money puts a lot of women in a position where they don't have agency or power. And I think that's very scary because a lot of the reason why some of these women are able to obtain these resources has a lot to do with like a transaction, right? Like you are trading your beauty, your time, your energy for money. And 
unfortunately we live in a society where that has a shelf life. Like you are not always going to look like this super hot Instagram model. Like at one point there will always be someone who's younger, hotter, better looking than you. And what happens when you've spent a certain period of your time investing in essentially obtaining money through the lowest hanging fruit, but also a means that isn't sustainable. And instead of investing in something that might be like a career or something that you are really personally passionate about. And listen, I'm not saying that we don't deserve a soft life, that we don't deserve to go on vacation, that we don't deserve that Starbucks or avocado toast, or to be able to buy that outfit we want. But I think there's a lot to be said for being able to do it yourself. And I think we're at a point now where it's very much a lot of young women saying, I don't want to do that. I want to be given money. And then with the money that I'm given, I'm going to make decisions that serve today me. Yeah, I mean, you, you saw the trend, right? On TikTok, it was like, um, I can always make the money back, but I'll never be X, Y, Z. And it was a series of conventionally attractive young women being like, you know, riding on this boy's motorcycle underneath the Eiffel Tower or on the Italian countryside on a girl's trip or doing things that may seem really fun and amazing, but could really hinder you over the long term. And I think what we need to realize is that neither approach is right. We need to find this happy medium where you're allowed to have those things that you enjoy, but also protect yourself and protect your future. Well, you brought up a lot of really interesting things in that, and particularly that whole, you know, and we've done a video on it, that that whole concept of you can earn more money, but you won't ever be 25 in Ibiza again or whatever, which is like, I, first of all, like, you want to be drunk in Europe, like, you can do that literally whenever, like, you, that'll always be there too, um, but also... The idea I think that you're kind of getting at is this one that, um, you know, if there is no real hope for a stable future, if you're not able to envision yourself at, uh, you know, a, a later uh, age in your life, you know, it's it's hard for young people to even conceptualize it, right? Like we, when we look at the psychological data, like it is just very difficult for human beings to conceptualize themselves that way. And I think where they're not wrong is definitely the path toward things like a super stable retirement, um, you know, building wealth, uh, being able to support a family, like all of those things have been seriously eroded. Um, but there is a shift, I think, more and more that I'm seeing, um, even in the decade that I've been doing this work, of going from not necessarily prioritizing your future self to almost in some ways denying its existence or feeling like it will never happen to you, feeling like you will never be retirement age and want to be able to, you know, spoiler alert, you're also going to want to travel when you're in retirement. You're not just going to want to do it while you're 25. Um, but I do think, you know, for, for a lot of people, you know, what your content does really well is obviously make a lot of really important financial information feel digestible and feel accessible um, and still feel fun, right? Like there's a lot of fun and room for, you know, indulgence and things like that in the content that you do. But how do you frame, you know, when you create your content, how do you strike that balance between these are the better long-term decisions you need to be making, this is how you need to conceptualize yourself, and still making a, a proper amount of room for enjoying and uh, being present today with your money. I think it's exactly what you said, striking that happy medium. Um, I think people are so used to watching content when they're told like, you know, quote unquote, you should be eating rice and beans until your debt's paid off or something like that. And like, as soon as someone hears that, they shut down, they don't listen. And I want to approach it so that if someone watches my content, they recognize that they can have it all. They don't need to choose one or the other. They just have to be really strategic about how they go about it. And back to your point of like denying this future, I think it's really easy to daydream and dream, 
but it's very hard to envision yourself in a reality where you've never seen someone who looks like you succeed. So the girl boss generation watched the parents and the people before them be able to go to college, get a good degree, get a good job and have that two and a half kids, white picket fence home and golden retriever. Whereas the generation behind girl boss was so visually aware that that wasn't happening anymore. And when they couldn't see people who looked like them, people from their communities, people who had the same pedigrees or the same backgrounds or had, you know, their similar identity succeeding, I think that's what's led to this all or nothing mentality of like, you can either give up everything that you love in your life to have this potential future, maybe versus I can have a guaranteed thing today. And that thing is going to provide me more joy than this maybe future. So I think it's just about explaining that that isn't the case and that whether or not you think the future is coming, like it is, unfortunately, we all grow up, we all get older, we all, you know, have to eventually take care of ourselves when we can't work because we're human and our bodies and our minds can't physically work. 14 hours a day when you are 60, 70, 80. That's true. Although, you know, more and more people are having to put themselves through doing it. Um, You know, obviously your content lives primarily on social media, which is, um, you know, I think we could spend hours talking about the negative impacts that social media has had on people's finances. Um, and specifically their relationship to spending. And obviously a lot of what you talk about is being more mindful in the choices that you're making with your money and um, in what you're spending on. But, you know, if you're thinking about, you know, an average young, I would assume the majority of your audience is women. Is that fair? Yeah. Because men don't watch women. (laughs) That's one thing that I've learned in my years in media. But, um, But so if you imagine like an average, you know, young 20 something woman who has you on her feed, chances are high that there will be one of your videos, which, you know, is kind of a a healthy reset financially, but it will probably often be sandwiched between several other videos that are really aspirational in nature that show people, you know, doing haul videos or try-ons or, you know, eating at luxe restaurants or traveling or doing all of these different things that really encourage, if not mindless spending, the idea that spending and happiness are pretty intrinsically linked. Um, and it, especially with the internet, it is easier than ever to spend and, you know, obviously in some cases to get yourself into debt, but in general, just um, satisfy a lot of other urges and needs with, you know, putting something in your shopping cart and checking out. So, When it comes to navigating social media from a perspective of protecting your, you know, healthy boundaries around spending and not encouraging yourself even subliminally to spend more, more recklessly, how do you recommend people find that healthier relationship with social media and consumption and how do you use it? Yeah, I would say it's really important to curate your feed for curate your feed in a way that serves you. So I used to follow a bunch of influencers and some of them would be size zero complaining about how, you know, they felt like they had a food baby when they had a burrito. And that like, wasn't healthy for me to be watching from like a body positivity perspective. And so I was like, I can no longer follow this person. It's no strike against them. Their content's great, like whatever, but like, I cannot personally be following this person in the same way that like, if you have an influencer on your feed, or if you have someone, or even just a friend on your feed who is constantly making you feel less than because of their spending habits versus your spending habits versus how much money they have. I just think it's okay to mute them. It's okay to unfollow them. It's okay to do what you need to do to protect yourself mentally. and. I would say that as someone who is now a digital creator, who is an influencer, it's actually gotten a lot easier for me because I know the secrets behind the game now. And when I see a celebrity talking about how much they love X, Y, Z thing, I'm like, you got gifted that. That was free for you. 
So of course you're going to say you love it. Like I love free stuff. Everybody loves free stuff, but it's not free for the followers who see that. And they're like, Oh, this is a real recommendation. Like, I think that's why I do. I try to make as much of a concerted effort to show people be like, Oh, by the way, this was gifted. Oh, by the way, this is PR. Oh, by the way, this is actual, just something I paid for with my own dollars. This is a hotel room I booked. I didn't get a media rate. This is food that I actually enjoy consuming all the time. This is something that I ate and tried and didn't like because people need to know. And I think people forget that de-influencing is still influencing just in a way that's actually better for people's wallets and people's pockets. And I, I give an example of like, I made a video review about a very expensive scrub scrub was like 42 bucks for a container. I bought it. I could not deal with the smell. The smell was so strong. And I was like, this is, this smells kind of like cheap. I don't understand why this is $42 to the point where I couldn't use it. And people were shocked when I was like, I actually don't like this brand. It's an influencer fave, but I don't like it. There's this $8 bar of soap that comes in a built-in sponge that exfoliates just as well. And I actually had people comment being like, you don't have to tear down one brand to lift up another. I'm like, this is not comparing two people. This is me comparing two products. And one of which can objectively be better or worse in my opinion. And on top of that, I can give you the rationale of why this is better for your wallet. And people were so thankful because they were like, I was going to buy this. And $42 to somebody else might be a lot more imperative than $42 is to me. So I think we need to be honest. We need to show the good and the bad because right now, social media is 100% a highlight reel. You only hear about stuff when it's amazing. You only hear about stuff when people are trying to plug their, you know, affiliate code or their partnership, but like, just talk about what you like and talk about what you don't. Yeah, I, it's, uh, so I have a, a rule on my personal accounts that I don't um, do anything sponsored or, or take any gifts for that particular reason because I do want to make sure that any time that I'm showing my life, my real life to any extent that it's an accurate reflection of my finances, to be perfectly honest, um, because I do think that there is a real slippery slope when it comes to influencing and and specifically people, you know, you are someone whose content is not fundamentally about you, right? Like you are, you're here to educate people financially and you use your expertise and, you know, there obviously is a good amount of you in it, but it's not about look at my life and how great it is and, you know, how beautiful I am and all of that kind of stuff, Um, which I think is a really healthy distance between yourself and what you're creating. But a lot of, you know, the most popular influencers, the most popular figures that people are consuming on social media their entire value proposition is their own life and their own, you know, the house they live in, the family they have, the, you know, the places that they go um, and the products they buy. And I do wonder, you know, when it, when it gets to a point that the personal and the professional or the monetizable are so inextricably linked, at what point does your, personal choice even end and a business decision begin. Um, Especially, you know, we've done content on things like family creators um, who, you know, we need a whole new battery of child labor laws to deal with what's going on on social media, not a joke. Um, But there is this inherent kind of feeling that anything that they do for, you know, their own brand or for earning money is something that should almost to some extent be beyond criticism. I mean, you mentioned the fact that people got mad at you for criticizing a product, which is ultimately the entire concept of even being a consumer is that you get to choose which products you like and don't. Um, But I think that because the personal and the brand have been so merged over the past few years and the past decade, really, that there's almost this feeling that Brands are people, people are brands, and products, therefore, are sort of inherently good and inherently a part of your own identity and inherently kind of above criticism. And I do often wonder, like, how do we even, how are we even going to be 
rational consumers and thoughtful consumers in a world where brands have become almost like friends in the way that they're represented on our screens. I think we need to just remember that like that friendly demeanor is like some social media marketer who likely is young and has a fun sprightly voice and like sure you could be friends with that person but like at the end of the day like brands do not care about you they are not people they are not creators they are brands and they are for-profit brands that make money and their ultimate goal is to sell you more stuff and so i think like sure there are certain brands that have missions and tie-ins that are great but we just have to remember at the end of the day, like these brands are serving themselves. Like their relationship with us as consumers is entirely that it's transactional. Like they do not care about you. Like if you were to lose your job, like they're not going to be the ones to support you. So I think we need to be really, really picky and really, really discerning about who we choose to give our money to do their values align with ours. Are they, doing work with the funds that they're creating that is also, you know, aligned with our personal missions and morals and ethics. And, you know, I, I think it's just important to remember that you as a consumer, you and your dollar have power and value, and you should only be giving that dollar to brands that have shown over and over again, that they have at least some sense of moral compass you know, I think there are certain, like, they're all corporations at the end of the day, but there are certain brands that are much better than others. And, you know, I give an example. Uh, I never feel bad spending $5 on a pint of Ben and Jerry's because I feel like their product is good. I like how it tastes. Um, I like their company mission. They've stood by values that I am aligned with. And they also make sure that their corporate profits go towards something bigger than themselves. And a lot of other ice cream companies don't. And so it's easy for me to make a educated choice at the grocery store. And I think we need to be doing that with every single vertical that we consume in. So if you're watching on video and have been admiring my top and earrings, uh, I'm pleased to report that they actually came from today's sponsor, Quince. And I'm obsessed, literally. And if you're looking to upgrade your wardrobe this summer and want to spend your money wisely on high quality essentials that will last beyond the season, Quince is the place for you. We don't gatekeep around here. So know that Quince is the spot for luxury without paying luxury prices. How do they do it? Quince partners directly with top factories to cut out the cost of the middleman and pass the savings on to you. All of Quince's prices are 50 to 80% less than similar brands, and they only work with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium eco-friendly fabrics and finishes. With timeless classic pieces that won't go out of style, you can start building your capsule wardrobe with Quince. So as I mentioned, um, my top and my little gold earrings, they're actually real gold, are both from Quince, uh, which I was so excited to see how, like, frankly, adorable these clothes were. I am actually obsessed with this shirt. Fun fact is that I actually love like a silk blouse like this. And I own a few um, that were massively more expensive than this. And the quality of this feels absolutely amazing. It's like indistinguishable from my other really fancy ones. I was like shocked at uh, the prices that they were able to maintain with this quality. Um, it arrived super fast. The shopping experience was incredibly easy. And I'm actually, uh, with my own money, going to go buy a few more of their items because I'm just really falling in love with the vibe, but also how it feels. Um, I feel rich, bitch. And as you can sort of see, I've styled it with, um, I have white cropped uh, jeans here and a black belt and some black shoes. Um, feeling very like, you know, I'm not gonna use all that old money, quiet luxury terminology, but I do feel rich and chic. So get like me and upgrade your closet this summer with Quince. Right now, go to quince.com slash TFC to get free shipping and 365 day returns on your next order. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash TFC for free shipping and 365 day returns. Kind of pivoting a bit to, to talk about, you know, the name that you chose for your brand. I mean, I don't know if it was like what happened with TFD where it was just like, I just sort of came up with it and then it was like, all right, well, I guess now people associate me. It wasn't like a super intentional branding. Um, 
so A, I'm, I'm interested how you arrived at the name Your Rich BFF, but kind of more importantly, rich is an interesting word to use in the context of everything we've talked about. Um, because I do think for a lot of people, you know, there is a real skepticism about the idea of individual wealth accumulation and wh how much is too much. And, you know, we can see obviously all of the, you know, destructive things that happen in our society as a result of wealth inequality. But I'm interested, you know, how you came up with the name, your relationship with the name today, and where you kind of land on you know, personal wealth versus, you know, building a more sustainable uh, economy? Yeah. So the name, again, another happy accident. Um, out of my group of girlfriends from college, I am the dumbest one. Uh, mm -hmm. They all went on to get graduate degrees. One of them is currently a surgical, like a plastic surgery resident. Uh, one of them is graduating law school, about to become a big time attorney Two just graduated and got their MBAs. Like they're all smarter than me, but I was the first person to really start making a lot of money. And when they would come and visit, we would go out to lunch or dinner and me knowing that they were continuing education and probably didn't have funds the way that I did, I would pick up the tab just like as a nice gesture for my friends. And the comment would always be like, oh, love having a rich best friend. So nice. Ha ha ha. And so when I went to go create my uh, handle, I looked up rich best friend taken your rich best friend taken. So then I was like, okay, well, like what's another word for this? And I was like, okay, your rich BFF was available. So I just settled. It wasn't my first or even my second choice. Um, but now I'm actually really, really happy with how the name worked out because I think a lot of people are afraid of the word rich. And I think rich often comes with the negative connotation of like a Scrooge McDuck and a, you know, hoarding of the wealth type vibe. But for me, I love the word rich because I think we all deserve to have rich lives. And I think that word can be defined differently for every single person who encounters it. For some people, a rich life is being able to live out of an Airstream and retire when they're 30. For some people, it's more the traditional route of being able to retire when they're 60, have one primary residence, a vacation home down somewhere in Florida, and be able to help their kids, you know, pay for college in full. Everybody's version of rich looks very different, but I don't think wanting richness for yourself or for the people you love is a bad thing. Uh, I guess addressing your point of like this very Indiv individualistic mindset. Like I come from a family of Chinese immigrants and Eastern versus Western culture is very different in that way. In that in Eastern cultures, it's very much of like for the group, for the squad. Like you would never see the behavior that you see in the US in Japan, frankly, because there's almost like this like group shame of like, do not be a burden to society. Do not, do not be rude. Do not act up, treat people with respect because we all work together as an ecosystem. Whereas on the West, it's very much, it's like me, 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 me. And I think that is bad in many, many respects. I think it's okay to care about other people. But one thing I will say is that what you can do with this individualistic mindset is use it to then lift up communities. So it goes back almost to a greater good conversation. So um, a lot of people who follow me are first gen immigrant kids like me. And a question that I was getting a lot was like, I'm the first person in my family to go to college. I'm the first person to get a quote unquote fancy white collar desk job. I make six figures. And now everybody in the family tree is knocking on my door for a gift, for a loan, for a handout. 
And my advice was, as someone who comes from that type of culture, where it is totally normal to give money to family, it's okay to do that, but you still need to set boundaries. Because at the end of the day, you cannot start your life on uneven financial footing on a poor foundation. You need to build on strong, solid ground because then 10 years from now, 20 years from now, when you are really, really solid, when you built up this financial home, this financial, you know, empire or this like really, really safe fortress, then you can really think about, Hey, how can I put money back into the AAPI community in downtown New York? These are things that I'm thinking about because um, I just drafted a living will and a big part of my wealth, if I, if anything were to happen to me would go to a couple causes that I really, really care about. And why I think it's important for individuals who are people of color, of women, people in the LGBTQ community, people who grew up low income, for them to have this richness is because those people are so, so likely to then funnel that money back into those communities, back into those disenfranchised groups who haven't had this opportunity for richness. And if you can have one individual succeed, it's really easy to pull up the whole squad. Like you bring the whole entourage. And I think it's important to understand that while the individualistic mentality isn't necessarily inherently bad, it can become inherently bad if it means that you are then not doing anything with those individual successes that you were able to get because of a group effort. Do you feel like you have a sense of what is enough when it comes to earning money? Because for me, it's something I think about a lot uh, in the past few years, especially. Um, you know, for example, at our company, we do a four day work week, which um, was a really kind of, uh, it was, it worked out for a lot of reasons. We're really happy with it, et cetera. Um, but it is on some level, although we didn't cut pay or anything and we have increased revenue. There, there was, I think, at some level, a really clear decision of like, we could keep working more and maybe earn more, but at a certain point, our time is more valuable, being able to enjoy what we have is more valuable and kind of all of those things. Um, and in my own life, you know, especially as someone who lives in a dual income, no kids household. Ooh, we love a dink. Listen, I can't say it's not a fabulous life. Let me be clear. <laughs> um, but also, I mean, you know, we do live below our means, right? We have a pretty small apartment comparatively. We don't have a car. We don't have any of the things that I think normally keep people um, kind of on a bit of a hamster wheel of, of lifestyle inflation. Um, but even still, no matter how much you try to avoid it, there are going to be uh, very insidious ways that more wealth kind of begets and then necessitates more wealth. And that can be your social circles. That can be the neighborhood you live in. That can be all kinds of things. Often it will be having children because that, you know, doesn't just necessitate the raw costs. It also, for many people, if they're more upwardly mobile, their children are extraordinarily expensive and have access to all kinds of things that, you know, many children uh, didn't growing up or don't now. So as someone who, in your case, is accumulating a lot of wealth, is very successful financially, um, and does the kind of work where it's not like you're paid a base salary, right? It's not like you work for a company and someone says, you do this, I give you this. So there are always more things that you could be doing. There's always ways for you to work more, make more, et cetera. How do you find the sort of tipping point of this lifestyle is enough, I would rather work less and enjoy my life more. Um, and I'm not necessarily focused on continuing to augment my income or has that point not come? You know, I think this is something that I'm still working on. When I worked a normal W2 job for somebody else, for a corporation, it was really easy for me to be like, Boop, it's six laptops closing. See you guys tomorrow. But now that I'm my own boss, it's something that I struggle with. I'll send emails off at 11 PM at night. And I'm like, why am I doing this? Like, just like go read a book, go watch some TV, like be a normal person. And I think for me right now, that point has yet to come of where I'm like, I need to dial it back. Me and my fiance have intentions of 
I don't even know how, like what the phrase is anymore, but like bringing children into our family eventually. Do I know if it's going to be birth children, adoption? No, like none of the details have been fleshed out, but like, I think that's something that we want. And because of that, I feel like, frankly, one of us is going to need to downshift in our careers. And also knowing the type of career that I have, I always like to joke, I'm like, I'm an NFL player. You get five good years and then you blow out your knee and it's game over. And that's how I feel about being a creator sometimes. It's very scary because this isn't a job that, you know, this job hasn't even been around long enough to have a 40 year lifespan. The creators of the beginning of the internet are not really that relevant now. Frankly, creators from five to 10 years ago are not even that relevant now. And to stay relevant and stay, you know, in the pop culture zeitgeist, I think it's something that I always feel like I'm on a treadmill, that I'm always trying to like create a new piece of content, that I'm always trying to do one more thing, da 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 da. And I can for now because I'm 29, I'm not married yet, I don't have kids, I don't have a pet. I don't have anybody else who really depends on me right now for my time, energy, and love with the exception of my fiance. But I think that'll change. That'll certainly change in the next three, four years. And my thought is if I'm able to make a really, really lucrative living right now over these couple of years, I'll then be able to be thoughtful with how I'm investing, how I'm setting aside that money, for the future so my money can work while I might be able to take a downshift in my career so that I'm able to be around for my kid in, you know, frankly, a way that my parents weren't able to for me. My parents are immigrants. They came over in their 20s from China, could barely speak English. And I'm very, very fortunate. They worked incredibly hard, but they were not at the school plays they were not at the soccer matches. They were not at the ballet recital. Like they never showed up to anything. And it's because they were working. And when I was younger, I always held it against them. And I felt like all they care about is money. All they care about is working. Looking back, I, you know, I obviously had no idea that they were not feeling at all financially stable. They weren't making a lot of money. And they wanted to provide me as many opportunities as I could. And I didn't realize that like those ballet lessons cost money. Yeah. Swim lessons cost money. And for me to be able to do those things, whether or not my parents were actually able there to witness, like they had to make that money. And I think I'm in a position now where I can put myself in a temporary period of turbo go-go mode so that when I do need to take a step back, I can afford myself that luxury because buying your own time back is a luxury. And I say that with a lot of gratitude because a lot of people can't. Do you think that, you know, not just for you in particular, but it's something we hear all the time. So I'm not a child of immigrants, but I did grow up low income. And I think similarly to you, watching my parents work as hard as they did and have, you know, as relatively little as they did. Um, you know, now they're more middle class, but it definitely was a, a big struggle when when we were young, when I was young. Um, I think that there, in many ways, is sort of, I, I still feel today, even after 10 years of doing this work and talking about this stuff, and in many ways being very, very comfortable with money, I still feel that there are some kind of inherent, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There's inherent static around money and work for me that I almost at some level feel I'll never be rid of. Um, like for me, I have a, I have a real chip on my shoulder about people who's like, and in New York, it's so ubiquitous in New York. You sort of have to just pretend it's not happening, but like people in their thirties whose parents pay half their rent, like, oh. I, so annoying. And I'm like, listen, I'm obviously objectively extremely privileged. I am not trying to say that like, you know, whatever their privilege is fine, but 
it is hard for me not to have that chip on my shoulder when I see like people in my life who, you know, have children who are going to these elite private schools and they have tutors and they have, you know, all of these incredible resources. And then you think, I think back to the public schools that I went to and how we didn't even have money for books, you know? Um, and there are those chips on my shoulder about certain things. And then similarly, when it comes to the idea of, you know, I, I do have a tendency, especially this year, to really overextend myself and say yes to everything um, and to put things on my plate in part because I think there's always this subconscious idea that I have to do it. If I don't do it, no one else will, you know, helping support people, but also helping ensure that I will always be, you know, safe and secure and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and having something to prove, you know, really feeling that need of like, I am going to prove that even though I don't have a college degree, even though I don't have, I didn't have any of these things growing up, that I can do these same things that other people can do and, and what have you. And everyone's baggage around money is different, right? Although I think there are a lot of common threads. You hear a lot of similar things from people who grew up low income. A lot of people who had, you know, extremely hardworking immigrant parents will have similar baggage and all of that kind of stuff. And although I definitely do, you know, a lot of sort of therapeutic and mental health work to um, make really, really healthy financial and personal decisions um, separate from a lot of that baggage, it is still something I really struggle with. So my, you know, kind of curiosity for you is what do you feel like are the, you know, emotion, the bits of emotional baggage you're dealing with around money and how do you work to counteract them uh, in, in the work that you do? Yeah, um, I think it can really be summed up in two words, scarcity mindset. My parents being immigrants were in a constant state of feeling like the other shoe was going to drop. And that's why my parents didn't negotiate for raises. They were like, well, I don't want to get fired, but I feel very lucky in that I am very privileged. I'm entitled. I was born here. And I don't mean that like in a, like I'm a Karen at the front of like the, you know, the McDonald's line, like yelling at some poor um, cashier. Like I am entitled in that I belong. I know that I'm an American. I got that blue passport, baby. And for me, that entitlement allows me to think about how like, I'm not just here to survive. I'm here to thrive. And my parents, they did everything that they could. They moved us into the smallest, least expensive home in the best school district. So I went to a really good public school. But there were certainly people who had like college counselors, college tutors who were like basically writing their college essays for them. There were people who were doing all of that. And like, I think I showed up to U Chicago, which is obviously a very, very elite college. And I looked around at all these people who had gone to these prep schools in New York, who had gone to these private boarding schools, whatever. And then I had this chip on my shoulder of like, am I less than? But it felt a little bit like, damn, your parents spent all that money. And for us to just end up at the same place. <laughs> and I think that was the first time I realized that like, I didn't need to have gone to prep school to be smarter than these people. I didn't need a college counselor to write my essays because my essays were just as good. And that um, that like moment of like getting into that club of getting into that type of college, like felt like a, a moment of like, almost like a true up, like a great equalizer where I was like, now I'm here, let me bust my ass. And I hate to be the one to say this, but there were so many people that came from money that had these trust funds and they just like, didn't worry the way that I did. And for them, it was like, oh, like I'm gonna be a, you know, art history major and I might curate a gallery after school. They're like, I'll just do whatever I want. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. That sounds awesome. I think it says a lot about our society that like when money is not a factor, people go into the arts. That's great. I love art, but that was never an option for me. Yeah. I knew that I had to major in something that was going to get me paid because I wasn't going to get any help from my parents. 
after graduation. I'm very, very lucky that they gave me the biggest possible gift. They helped pay for part of my education. The other half I got through scholarships, grants um, from the school for merit, what have you. But I didn't come out with any student debt. And I recognize that that is the greatest privilege because student debt is hindering an entire generation. I mean, it is just really, really hurting so many people. When I went to the job hunt and, you know, there were options, I immediately thought, let me go to Wall Street because I'm going to get paid there. And this will be the first time that like I can make that kind of money. And the amount of money I made my very first year was more than my dad had ever been paid in a year in his entire life. And it's something that I still work through because even now making multiple six figures, you know, the business is a seven figure business. I ask my fiance all the time. I'm like, should we just like look at the budget again? Like, are we spending too much? And he goes like, no, our spending has not really changed over the past two, three years, but like, we're making a lot more money. Like, what are you freaking out about? And it's just that constant fear. And I don't know if that's something I'm ever going to get rid of per se, but it is something that I can work to combat. But when you have scar tissue, you have scar tissue. And I think our lived experiences dictate how we approach life. Yeah, it's, it is really tough to, to deal with. And I think, you know, there is, it, it, it is, and I understand for a lot of people who follow us, like there's such a sense of unfairness about all of it in terms of, you know, the way that you had to work and have real merit to get to the schools that you got to and the job that you got to. And it is so tough to see. I think it's mostly that we still insist on thinking or talking like we live in a meritocracy. Um, not even close, not even close. And when you think about, you know, two people who both go to Harvard, but you look at how they both got there, um, and the idea that all we see is the name on the CV or all we see is, you know, the, the fact that you're there, we don't ever really stop to think about how vastly different that achievement is for two different people. I think it can be really, really difficult for a lot of people, myself included some days, to get over that sense of unfairness. Again, especially when I look around, you know, having grown up low income and now being um, in a completely different social class and therefore surrounded by people of that higher social class and seeing all of the immense privileges and advantages conferred to those children. Um, of course, I, I adore those children and I'm so happy for them and it's so great that they get that. But it is so hard to not think about all of the children that don't and will have to work, you know, 10 times as hard, if not more, just to get the same baseline. Um, and that is only increasing, right? That's only becoming more acute with wealth inequality um, and with so much of our society being predicated on debt and these really, really predatory financial systems. So kind of just as a closing thought, you know, my biggest question every time I, I make content, especially that's, you know, very like cultural commentary and talking about how a lot of things are, um, is how do you find that balance between feeling that righteous sense of this system isn't fair and needs to change and I'm going to do what I can to, um, to, to better my situation in the meantime without giving into that resentment or despair? You know, I, I don't hold it against people who have generational wealth because I think all of us would love to build generational wealth for future children, you know, down the family tree, whatever. But we hate seeing generational wealth in use. We absolutely hate it when someone's grandpapa donates a library and, you know, Branford Winston Worth III gets into Harvard. We hate it. And I think, am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yes. There's levels to this. <laughs> like, I think 
there's one thing with having generational wealth so that you are able to provide your child with an SAT prep tutor. I think there's another conversation with buying a library and guaranteeing your children entry because the library was $40 million. I think we should all strive to be able to provide the best life for ourselves, for our loved ones in that way, building a rich life. I also think that we should really try our best to stop glorifying people who have ultra wealth as if they're smarter or better than us because they're not. In many cases, they have done what I'm telling people to do now. It's just that they they had some really, really uh, high earning, you know, rich person somewhere up their family tree. And over time, that money has just been able to compound. They have time on their side, not better person-ness, not intelligence. And I think we should focus on valuing people who work hard and are able to provide. But the people who have so much and refuse to then, frankly, do anything productive with it, it should be held against them. I don't think, and I know this is like such a hot take, I don't really think people should be allowed to have more than like a billion dollars because frankly that money isn't doing anything for the greater good it's being hoarded and that money wasn't made from ingenuity that money was made off of the backs of other people i think you are allowed to be rich and frankly when you have a billion dollars there's not a damn thing on the planet that you can't buy there's not a single thing you cannot have if you want. There will always be people who have more money than others. Fine. But when you have hundreds of millions of dollars or hundreds of billions of dollars, because there's, let's also really be clear, there's a huge, huge difference between millionaires and billionaires. Millionaires are closer to being homeless than they are closer to, than they are to being billionaires. And when you have hundreds of billions of dollars and you're not doing anything with it, and your plan is not to donate to charity, your plan is to literally just keep leaving it on and on and on and on, that's how we end up with wealth inequality like we have today. I agree with your hot take. I would actually lower the bar. I think no one should be able to have more than like, I don't know, man, 100 million already seems like too much to me. Like I I just, I really don't see... I don't know. I, I really feel like there's, and we, we've done so much, we've done so many videos on it. Like just even from a mental health perspective, like it is, it makes people like mentally ill to have that much money. Um, they're literally like they become less empathetic. They become more, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? More tribalistic. Uh, they have, they, they, their brain starts to change when they have that much money because you are now living in a completely, essentially your whole life is a gated community basically. And you have such a level of convenience and such a level of, um, distance from the average person. And you never have to interact with anyone in a way you don't want to. And there's just so many aspects of it that destroy the fabric of community and really, really mess with people's mental health. But I totally agree that that part of one of the biggest problems driving wealth inequality is people's in genuine inability to to visualize what a billion dollars is and what a million dollars is and people tend to sort of conflate the two and to your point they could not be more different um like someone who has a million dollars at 60 years old is someone who just is a is able to have like a a somewhat comfortable retirement and like maybe go on a trip every year and live off of that. Like you need more than a million dollars to be able to have a proper retirement at this point. Um, a billion dollars has nothing to do with that. You know, that's private island money. Um, and, you know, so I totally agree. And I think there, the more that we get, you know, conscientious about wealth inequality and the more we get lucid about what these numbers mean, the easier it will be to kind of collectively push back because some of these really rich people, I'm like, you are like bold as shit posting all of this stuff all the time. Like 
the guillotines are coming, babe, and they're going to come for the person who's constantly posting, um, you know, taking their private jet 45 minutes and just completely giving the middle finger to the planet um, in order to, you know, make a, a football game and then go to dinner in another city that they want to. Like, people are people are wild with flaunting that wealth. Um, so for someone who has a social media presence that is in many ways the antidote to that kind of nonsense and really, really healthy to follow, um, I cannot recommend Your Rich BFF anymore. Um, please uh, let our audience know where to find you and, you know, what you're up to. Yeah. You can find me across all social media as Your Rich BFF. And I also have a podcast of my own called Net Worth and Chill. And you can find that wherever you listen to podcasts, wherever you're currently listening to this podcast. And at the end of the year, uh, December 26th, 2023, my very first book is launching. It's called Rich AF, The Winning Money Mindset That'll Help Change Your Life. And you can pre-order it now at richaf.me. Yes, I made the URL a manifestation. Sue me. <laughs> <laughs> I love the name of that podcast, by the way. Uh, that's a great name. Uh, so all of that will be linked in the description and I will see you guys next week. Uh, thank you so much, Vivian, for being here. And thank you guys for tuning in. I'll see you next Monday on an all new episode of The Financial Confessions. Bye. Mm-hmm.